Good afternoon, and welcome to Working with Diverse Communities to Explore Environmental Health. I'm Michelle Dixon, and I am the Program and Development Director for the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Courtney Carrigan. Dr. Carrigan is an exposure scientist and epidemiologist at Michigan State University with over 15 years of experience in environmental public health. She conducts biomonitoring and health studies for a wide range of populations, including those with occupational and recreational exposures, contaminated drinking water, infertile couples, pregnant women, mothers, infants, and children. Dr. Kerrigan's work has contributed to public health interventions aimed at reducing exposures to flame retardants, PFAS, and arsenic. She received her PhD in environmental health from the Boston University School of Public Health and completed her postdoctoral training at both Dartmouth and Harvard. Dr. Kerrigan, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So let's start by um, talking about uh, communities. So a community is a group of people who share a location, characteristic, or both. And many of the communities I work with typically have an elevated exposure to an environmental contaminant such as PFAS, flame retardants, or PFAS or are exposed during a sensitive developmental window, and sometimes both. Here are some of the communities that have investigated flame retardant exposure among. They include nursing mothers, office workers, spray foam workers, and gymnasts. But first, what are flame retardants? So flame retardants are chemicals that are added to products to help reduce their flammability. They're found in upholstered furniture, plastic casings, electronics, home insulation, carpet padding, and even in some baby products, historically. They're not bound to the foam, and so they off-gas and settled into the dust, which is then ingested by people. We all ingest a little bit of dust every day, especially young children who crawl on the ground and do more mouthing behaviors. Infants can also have elevated exposure to flame retardants through ingestion of breast milk, because flame retardants are um, bioaccumulative, some of them, and they accumulate in the body and are excreted through breast milk. A, cl a class of flame retardants known as polybromate diphenyl ethers were used extensively for several decades and have been associated with changes in thyroid hormone, um, impacts on neurodevelopment, and negative impacts on reproduction. Because of some of these concerns, the PPDEs were phased out of use starting in 2005, and were replaced with other flame retardants, including TDC-IPP and Firemaster 550, which is a mixture of brominated and organophosphate flame retardants. In a study of nursing mothers, we measured hexabromocyclodidecane, or HBCD, in breast milk as a marker of maternal exposure. And we found that higher concentrations were associated with a greater number of stereo and video electronics in the home, which makes sense because HBCD, one of its primary uses is in um, the plastic casings of electronics. In another study of office workers, we found that exposure to the organophosphate flame retardant TRIS-1,3-dichloro-2-propylphosphate, or TDC-IPP, was higher among workers in older buildings and lower among those who reported washing their hands six or more times per day. This work helped contribute to a number of exposure reduction interventions EPA issued a significant new use rule for HBCD. There were updates to the national as well as city fire codes to allow buildings to meet, um, to allow the furniture to meet flammability standards without the use of flame retardants, as well as labeling requirements for polyurethane foam products. So I was really excited a few years ago to um, be shopping for a, a mattress pad, a, a foam mattress pad, and find this tag on it that said it contained no added flame retardant chemicals. I'm a former gymnast, and so about a year into studying flame retardants, it occurred to me that they might be used in the foam and gymnastics training facilities. So I went to my old gym and I collected samples of foam and dust from the foam pit and from other places in the gym. And we found extremely high levels, um, especially in the foam pits. I did a biomonitoring study, a small biomonitoring study of competitive gymnasts and found that their exposures were similar to occupationally exposed people such as foam cutters and carpet installers. 
And of course, not only competitive gymnasts use foam pits in gymnastics training facilities and even trampoline parks, you've probably seen these pits there as well. Uh, they're very popular among younger children. People, um, they'll spend a lot, of, can spend a lot of time in these facilities at camps and so forth. And so um, I founded the Gymnast Flame Retardant Collaborative to engage with the gymnastics community and share what I had learned and get their feedback on what some next steps for research uh, should be. So with support from the Toxics Use Reduction Institute at UMass Lowell and in partnership with Silent Spring, we partnered with a fire protection engineer at Worcester Polytechnic Institute to develop recommendations for maintaining fire safety without the use of flame retardants in the foam. We replaced a foam pit at a Massachusetts gym and we measured a threefold reduction in gymnast exposure. Gyms can now purchase flame retardant free pit cubes and they can share our guidance with their fire marshal to help assure that their gym meets fire safety requirements. And there's our website if you want to check it out. I also helped um, with an investigation of spray foam workers and we identified elevated exposures to the organophosphate flame retardant triphenyl phosphate among those workers and expected, um, we think that the higher exposure in particularly is from this trimming activity since it generates a lot of dust. So the workers will typically wear um, PPE, I'm told during the spraying process because of uh, concerns about exposure to um, something that, that volatilizes when they're spraying the foam um, and they can become sensitized to it. So they're generally pretty careful about that, but um, sometimes we'll take off their PPE and while well, they're doing the cutting and, and other activities, because I think often it's hot and that, that equipment's uncomfortable. I also worked with a population of infertile couples in Boston undergoing in vitro fertilization. We looked at um, organophosphate flame retardants as measured as urinary metabolites. We found that uh, higher concentrations of the urinary metabolite were associated with decreased um, implantation success, live birth, and um, clinical pregnancy. And this was an 18% decline in the ingested difference of the proportion of live births, which we think is a clinically relevant measure. So when I first started working on uh, exposure to these alternative flame retardants, uh, we didn't know that much about health effects. So one of the odd things about our chemical policy is that it basically allows for alternatives to be used before they're rigorously tested for safety. And so all of these alternatives went on the market after the phase out of the PPDEs and people were being exposed for over uh, for a decade while research on health effects were being done. And so meanwhile, we were you know, trying to understand about exposure and help reduce exposure while those studies were going on. Um, literature now shows that many of those replacements can, can also affect thyroid hormone, can affect on, on, on neurologic out, um, endpoints, and also uh, effects on reproduction, uh, like I just mentioned. Um, TDCIPP actually has a very interesting story to it um, in that it was a replacement for PDCI, um, um, so that's chlorinated tris, it was a replacement for brominated tris back in the 80s, I think it was <laughs> maybe even before I was born. Um, and the, the brominated tris was indicated to be a carcinogen and phased out of children's pajamas and then replaced with chlorinated tris, which is then phased out but never banned and, and continued in these other uses, but has been indicated also as a potential carcinogen. So another class of chemicals that suffers from this regrettable substitution issue are the poly and perfluoral alkyl substances or PFAS. You may have heard of them. They're very popular uh, and widely used for stain and water repellency as, many, as well as many other uses. So for example, um, they can be used on shoes. You might have sprayed them or you're just buying them that way. Same with furniture and carpeting. Um, they're used in the production of uh, waterproof jackets, like the, the fancy breathable kind. Um, they're used in paper food packaging, particularly, you know, I think the first one we knew about was micro popcorn, but lots of other paper food packaging. If it's water, water resistant, um, it likely contains PFAS. Um, Nonstick pans uh, like Teflon are made using PFAS. 
and the aqueous film forming foams, firefighting foams used for fight fuel fires contain a mixture of PFASs. So this class of chemicals is incredibly stable in the environment and difficult for our bodies to eliminate. Their extreme persistence has earned them the name forever chemicals. PFOA and PFOS, which are called C8 because they have eight carbons, were phased out of use over a decade ago, but hundreds of other PFASs are currently in use. PFASs are man-made chemicals that are manufactured, put into products and disposed of. They can make their way from industrial plants and landfills into waterways and then into our food and our drinking water. They're common not only in our products and the environment, but also in our bodies. Representative surveys have found them in over 98% of blood samples. We know that drinking water is an important way that people are exposed to PFAS. For those without contaminated water, it's believed that diet is the primary source. PFAS pass through the placenta and are excreted in breast milk, which is concerning because we know that fetuses and children are especially vulnerable to chemical exposures. Of the hundreds of studies on health effects, almost all have focused on PFOA and PFOS, which are historically the most prevalent. They've been found to affect multiple systems in the body and have been linked with a wide array of health concerns, including elevated cholesterol, changes in immune and hormone function, decreased fertility, and certain cancers, including kidney and testicular. Hundreds to thousands of PFAS chemicals may have been on the global market at some point in the past 50 years. However, our standard methods only measure around 20 of them, and like I mentioned, only two of them really have had a lot of health research, which like I mentioned before, is kind of what's required before, um, traditionally, traditionally required before much intervention can take place. PFAS containing products have mixture profiles. For example, here's a comparison of a waterproofing spray versus a firefighting foam. About seven years ago, um, I was living in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, about a, and I guess I moved there about a year after PFAS contamination was discovered at Pease Trade Port. Um, and people there were concerned because their children went to daycare there. They had lots of people worked there, thousands of people worked there, and you know they'd been drinking the water, and their children had been drinking the water, and they wanted blood testing. They wanted to understand more about PFAS because, like many water contaminants, um, especially emerging contaminants that I've worked on. They were told that, well, we know that, you know, you probably don't want this in your water. You probably don't want to be drinking it um, above a certain level, but we don't know what it means for your health. And so uh, they really wanted answers. They felt they weren't getting and advocated for biomonitoring and were able to get biomonitoring for over 2000 people uh, exposed to the water at Pease. And so we found some interesting things from that study, most notably the elevated concentrations of a less studied PFAS called PFHXS, which turns out to be um, common in the firefighting foam, at least the historic mixtures of firefighting foam uh, of AFFF. And um, what you can see here is a comparison of the Peace Trade Port, which is there in green, to the general population in the light blue, and to um, highly exposed populations near our manufacturing facilities in Ohio and Alabama and Minnesota. And the concentrations um, in this population, uh, over 40% were above the 95th percentile for the general population. And this is probably also related to the long half-life of PFHXS, um, which is believed to be over eight years. Uh, so that means it takes more than eight years for half of the amount of the chemical in your body to be eliminated. I also thought it was really interesting when you look at the way that the, um, when you plot the levels in blood, so this was a cross-sectional sample, but when you plot the levels in blood across age groups, what you see is that the, um, so the children were in daycare, right? So you can see an in, in increasing ages from zero to five, when a child would be in daycare, you see increasing concentrations of the, the, the PFASs in the age of mixture. So PFOS, PFOA, and PFHX, see them increasing in those children. And then when the children would not be um, on the trade port at these other ages, so they were probably there historically um, in daycare. Um, so we're eligible for the testing, you see the levels go down. And then when you see people work, enter workforce age, you see the levels go back up again. Um, so I thought this was a really telling graph of the relationship between drinking the water and the levels in the blood. <clears throat> 
So PEACE was one of the first uh, military installations to get tested. It was tested a year or so before uh, the EPA health advisory of 70 parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS was issued. That was a non-enforceable standard, it was an advisory. However, um, it did prompt the military to start testing. So these are all the sites that they did test. Um, and we, um, people who provided technical support like myself, became really overwhelmed with requests from communities uh, for more information and technical support. So one thing that um, I was fortunate to be able to do was to um, join a group of researchers at Northeastern and Silent Spring Institute, um, along with community uh, organizing at what's now Community Action Works um, and, and MVCC, which we're talking to here today, and uh, Testing for Peace, which is the community group that came out of Peace, uh, to organize the National Conference on the Social and Scientific Discovery of PFAS. Uh, so the first one took place at Northeastern University in June of 2017. We had a second one in 2019, and then we're planning another one in 2022, um, actually down in North Carolina, where there's the Gen X exposed community. And this conference was really different from any that I had ever attended or been involved with um, in that it invited and engaged environmental, both environmental and social scientists, environmental health and social scientists, uh, regulators, community leaders, legislators and lawyers and press, all people who work on PFAS but are in different sort of areas and so might not ever be at a conference together. And it was a really impactful conference. I, found it really fascinating um, and inspiring to hear all the different perspectives. Um, I found it to be really valuable, which I think a lot of other people did too, and that's why we continued having, having them. Um, our group that helped organize the conference, we did um, end up getting a formal project together, which is called PFAS Reach. Um, it has three aims. I'm just going to focus on one of them right now, which is the PFAS exchange. So I mentioned that we were really overwhelmed with you know, requests for technical support. So the PFAS exchange is really trying to help um, provide support for communities, um, people who are impacted, their governments, etc. One one element of the PFAS exchange. So this is an effort that's led by Laurel Shader at Silent Spring and Phil Brown at uh, Northeastern, and I'm uh, also involved. Um, is this tool for connecting communities. So you can go here and you can find out what community groups are near you. Um, you can find out, you know, what your state agencies are up to with regard to PFAS, if there's any health studies going on and any other resources that are relevant, um, might be useful to you. We also have lots of fact sheets. We've been working lots on this. Um, so we've got these fact sheets on here and, and more to come. Uh, we're going to be releasing one on um, health guidance, you know, talking to a physician and guidance for physicians soon, um, some on blood testing, and uh, I think one for firefighters. So these are all to, to, to be to come. So this is a sort of an effort under development. Um, another thing that happened after the conference is um, there was a lot of demand from the public for and their governments for testing, remediation, legislation, research, um, enforceable, uh, drinking water standards and guidance. Um, the Agency for Toxic Substances Disease Control Registry um, was funded to do some exposure assessments for military installations. So those have actually been completed. So here are some of the sites, and I think you can find that information now online. Um, they also funded to do a multi-site health study, which includes Pease and Hyannis on the Cape. Um, two communities I work with here in Michigan that I'm gonna talk about in a minute, and sites in several other states. Um, there's also uh, now uh, an exposure and health study for a community in North Carolina that's exposed to some new PFASs, which is called the GeoGenx study. And if you look historically PF at PFOS discharge, we can see um, some of the predicted patterns for where the higher levels of discharge are, you know, are expected to be. You can see the eastern <laughs> eastern side of the U.S. just light up. Um, those levels are much lower now, but I think what we don't know is what other PFASs are being used and excreted, you know, and, and put into the environment, and we might expect trends to look somewhat similar. A few years ago, I helped contribute to a study that estimated over 6 million Americans have been served by drinking water systems containing elevated concentrations of PFAS, an estimate that's since ris risen to over 110 million with detectable levels. We also found that systems were more likely to be contaminated with closer proximity to industrial sites and manufacturing PFAS, military fire training areas, AFFF certified or airports, 
and wastewater treatment plants. The Federal Health Advisory for PFAS in drinking water is not a regulatory standard. Therefore, testing has not been consistent across the country. Some states have conducted far more testing than others, which I think you can really tell here. Um, so you can see where there's more dots, there's more testing. Uh, this is not just to you know. Anyways, let's just leave it there. So including Michigan, um, Michigan has monitored for PFAS in over 1,700 public water systems that serve 80% of state residents. PFAS was detected in approximately 170 of those systems, about 10%, with elevated levels between 10 and 70 parts per trillion and about 51 or about 3%. Two systems had especially high concentrations exceeding the EPA health advisory. Um, so this actually did include community water supply schools and child care providers on their own wells and tribal water systems. So point sources of contamination that have been discovered in Michigan include military bases and airports, tannery operations, paper mills, and plating facilities. There have been drinking water interventions. So here's some examples of the types of interventions we've seen. Um, putting filtration systems in residential homes that are on their own well, putting big filtration systems into community wells, uh, delivering water you know, in a sort of emergency situation as these things get put into place, switching water from one water system to a cleaner one. Um, these interventions though are really costly and it's often unclear who will pay. Um, so that's some of the issues that we've been dealing with um, in terms of drinking water interventions. The first site, PFAS site identified in Michigan was actually over a decade ago, so well before any of that testing happened. Uh, at the former Ward Smith Air Force Base in Oscoda. Um, so you can see here the map of, of contamination around the base and around um, in the community. Um, I really think these photos of these systems that they had in the hangars to be really striking. So they would um, test these systems at, at Ward Smith and many other military bases and then just sweep the foam right out into um, the environment. Um, the kinds of questions I hear from community members is they want to know, you know, as veterans exposed to the foam um, and for veterans and civilians who drank the contaminated water, what were their exposure and what does it mean for their health? Um, in the community, people drink the water, ate local, ate local fish and game. Um, there are now deer and fish advisories in the community and they want to know what that, you know, what their exposure has been, what that means for their health and what it, they're concerned about their economy because their tourism is very important in this community. It includes trout fishing and a summer camp. So they want to protect their economy um, and the contamination also putting that at risk. And um, you know, they get a lot of enjoyment out of recreating in these beautiful lakes, uh, both Lake Huron and the Van Etten Lake uh, right there and, and other lakes in the community. And um, they're concerned because there's also even um, an advisory on about the foam. So uh, they have this kind of unusual foam that will pile up. It's very light and airy and washes up on the shore. Um, historically, children, you know, like, like you would expect most places would play in it and think it was fun to make a snowman or make a beard. Um, well, it turns out this, this foam is actually full of PFAS. It has very high concentrations of PFAS. It seems to um, kind of be accumulating there. The PFAS is kind of um, coming from the groundwater and discharging into the lake so that the levels in the lake are higher than what you would expect in, in other lakes. Um, so we put this paper out, um, we got involved with this, you know, sort of in response to the community concerns and we did a preliminary exposure est estimate which was similar actually to what the state had done um, and we did find excess risk from ingesting the foam um, and even the bulk water for children at the higher um, assumption and exposure levels. So I mentioned another community was discovered to have contamination from a tannery. Um, so that's what this picture is showing here. The tannery actually disposed of waste quite improperly um, into an unlined landfill that then contaminated the groundwater um, for people on private wells. So you see a little cluster where it says House Street. That's one community that has extremely high levels in their wells. Um, and I've talked with community members there who, you know, have lost loved ones to cancer, um, who have shared their biomonitoring results with their doctor and then discovered their own cancer, um, fortunately sooner than they may have otherwise. 
and um, women who have had, um, you know, experienced miscarriages and, and are concerned that it may be related to their exposure to the water. Um, so here's a picture of some of the, the tannery waste that you can find in that um, dump site there. So one tool that we developed to help people who do have um, blood test results or even water test results is on the PFAS exchange. Um, so this is called our what is my exposure tool. So you can put your concentrations in uh, to this tool and then it will map, it will graph it for you and, and show you where you fall uh, in relation to the general population and to other communities. Um, and also to if you put your water levels in, it will show where you fall in relation to water standards. So I hope this is a useful tool for people. Um, another community that I mentioned was uh, in relation to a paper mill. So this was a, a place where the levels in the water, um, in the public water system came back quite high, in, in a couple of hundred parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS combined. Um, their municipal wells were located near a former paper mill and its landfill, which was identified to be the likely source of contamination. Levels in the wells were well above the federal health advisory, like I mentioned, uh, and impacted thousands of residents who were already struggling under the loss of the city's primary industry. Here's a picture of um, the impacted area. So PFASs don't just affect drinking water. In many impacted communities like Parchment, there are, um, or Oscoda, I mentioned there are do not eat advisories for local fish as well as foods that were grown or produced using the contaminated water. So in parchment, one of the questions that was raised was, you know, is it okay for them to eat their um, produce from their gardens or their eggs from their chickens? And there are some studies on this um, and it was advised that they don't to be precautious. And so, um, you know, these concerns, they aren't unwarranted. We know that PFAS can be taken up by plants and that animals ingesting PFAS containing water or food can accumulate these chemicals in their bodies. However, plant uptake differs by soil type as well as PFAS concentration and carbon chain links. So for example, the legacy C8 PFASs such as PFOA and PFOS have been shown to accumulate less than plants compared to other PFASs currently in use. So I guess the answer is kind of complicated, which is why we're doing a study. So I'm part of a team of scientists that have been funded by EPA to help address these questions. Um, this is a collaboration with several universities across the U.S. And um, our goal is to assess the relative role of drinking water, diet, and the indoor environment in determining exposure for communities impacted by differing sources of PFAS. And the impact we're hoping to have is to inform and implement interventions to reduce exposure and improve health outcomes for individuals, impacted communities, and the public. So I mentioned I circle back to this PFAS reach project. So I'm helping lead the part of the study that's looking at effects on children's immune systems. So I just wanted to touch on this a little bit um, because it's kind of become especially relevant over this past year. So um, PFASs affect the immune system and it's a little bit different, difficult to say um, the direction because it really depends on what type of, what part of the immune system you're talking about. Um, if you're looking at the adaptive immune system, so when your body is exposed to a pathogen or a virus, we see a decrease in the body's immune response, to the body's ability to respond appropriately to um, that pathogen. And we're talking about the innate immune, immune system, so this is how your body responds to itself. Um, we see that PFAS exposure can be related to an increase in the body's response to self, so an inappropriate response to self, such as you would see in, for example, uh, autoimmune disease like ulcerative colitis. We also know that the immune system is one of the more sensitive endpoints for um, PFAS. So this is showing from ATSDR's uh, toxicological profile for PFOA and PFOS. Um, well, I guess they focus on PFOA and PFOS, but this, this profile isn't only for PFOA and PFOS, but the figure I'm showing here is for PFOS. And you can see that the immune outcome is the most sensitive. So the effects that you see occur at the lowest levels. And another um, thing that concerned me when I was looking at the PEAS data and looking at the literature, you know, back five, you know, five years ago, um, was this figure from one of Philippe Grandjean's studies in the Faroe Islands. 
where they looked at concentrations of PFOA, PFOS, and PFHXS in, uh, for children's exposure and uh, their response, their immune response essentially is what this is showing. And they found that children, um, so when I was looking at the PFHXS levels in the children in peas, their levels were off this graph. And we know that the um, um, antibody titer that is considered protective for diphtheria and tetanus is around 0.1. And so it's possible that, you know, for some children, they could drop below this and need additional intervention. So in these studies, they really use vaccination as um, a sort of functional test for the body's ability to respond to a pathogen, right? So in this case, a, a false pathogen. But when you get, a, when you get an immunization, you, your body is supposed to um, develop the antibody titer, and that's what protects you. So this isn't to say that... I think this still shows that vaccination is helpful, and you see that most children are in the um, protective range, but it's really used as a test, but could also have some clinical um, significance in addition to the population health implications of, of the impacts on the immune system. So in the pandemic hit, um, a lot of us who work on this and, and communities that we work with uh, were quite concerned about, you know, what their PFOS exposure would mean for their susceptibility to the coronavirus. And so we wrote this, um, this, this op-ed. So this is our PFAS reach team plus uh, one of our advisor, um, scientific advisory members, um, Jamie DeWitt, who's at Eastern Carolina University and a real expert in um, lab studies of PFAS impacts on the immune system. So there are quite a few groups now, um, including ours, that are looking at this. I think we're going to end there um, and just put in a plug. If you like books and movies and documentaries, um, there's a lot of media there out there now on PFAS issue and particularly around um, sort of the first community that discovered this um, in West Virginia. So I encourage you to take check that out. So with that, I just want to acknowledge the many, many, many people I worked with on some of the work that I presented today. Um, I collaborated with Heather Stapleton at Duke on almost all of it, so I just highlighted her there. And then people I worked with through my um, doctorate and my postdoc work, as well as the people I work with now um, on those two projects that I mentioned. And with that, I just want to thank all of you. Take any questions. Dr. Kerrigan, thank you. We do have some questions for you. Um, could you speak to the differences between community-based research and lab research. I think most people think research, they think of people in, you know, lab coats and test tubes. Um, but can you, can you talk to more about what makes community-based research work and why it's important? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess what I find important about community-based research is I really like, um, answering real world questions. So um, I forget sometimes that I'm more of an applied researcher. I like to, um, you know, be informed by the community about what their questions are. If I have a question, I want to engage with the community so that I make sure that I'm framing my question correctly and I'm um, approaching it in the right way. I think as I've done this work over the past decade, I've learned that um, there's a lot more to it than that. I mean, I think that's that's often what we're told as researchers, like this is why you should do community-based research um, because it will improve your research. Um, but it also improves your ability to, um, you know, turn research into action, right? So not only are people more likely to participate in your study if, if you're answering their questions and you're engaging with them, but they're also, um, there's also a lot more than the science to actually taking and putting public health into action. And so that's what I've learned is that these groups are really vital to, um, to turning research into action and protect communities. Um, I think lab research isn't, you know, it doesn't have to only be, I think lab research can be community-based research if, you know, you're doing lab science to address a question. So, um, you know, if you talk about like maybe the, you know, cancer community, people with, there's lots of different cancers that you can divide the cancer community into. But, um, you know, there's a lot of lab research that's done to support treatments in particular for cancer. So um, 
I guess, I guess there's probably a lot of like blending <laughs> over, but I, you know, I definitely, I guess I tend to think of community-based research as being working with communities and doing studies of people, but you can definitely still be doing studies that answer their questions in the lab. Um, and then there's basic lab research, which is really, which is more like trying to answer basic science questions and then hoping that they're going to have some relevance to real world questions or stumble upon a discovery that, you know, is, is field, you know, changes the field or changes the way that we think about something. Does that Great. make sense? Thank you. Yes, <laughs> that does. Thank you. Um, and I have a question. Um, one of our listeners would like you to, could you explain a bit about how biomonitoring works and how do you determine your study group, your control group? Um, so, okay, so first off, biomonitoring, uh, we're usually measuring, uh, taking a sample from a biological fluid like blood or urine or something less of a fluid like hair or, to or toenail. Um, it can really be anything from the body and then measuring, uh, usually in, in environmental health sciences, we're measuring exposure to a contaminant using that marker. So it might be the contaminate itself, or it might be a metabolite of that contaminate or a group of metabolites related to that contaminant. Um, and it gives you an idea about their exposure. So if, you know, a lot of these contaminants, uh, a lot of these chemicals that we study, uh, exposure occurs through, uh, like I mentioned, drinking water, diet, uh, the indoor environment, air and dust. And so it can be hard to quantify just based on environmental samples what somebody's exposure would be, especially over a long period of time. And so we use these tools together, the collecting of environmental samples, the, you know, administering of questionnaires and asking people lots of different questions related to their demographics and their exposure, and then also getting um, samples from them, their person. We also use um, tools like uh, we started using silicone wristbands and hand wipes as sort of intermediary, like less invasive ways to get indicators of, of personal exposure. In the air pollution world, they'll often use um, personal air monitors. So there's lots of different things that we can do to sort of try to understand uh, somebody's exposure um, using these types of biomonitoring studies. And there was another part to that question. I can't remember now what it was. I'm sure. So the second part of that question was, how do you determine your control group? How do you determine who's in your study group? So, you know, for a lot of like flame retardants and PFAS, um, I guess are just examples of contaminants where everyone's exposed. And so, you know, you want to get a good distribution. You want to get people who have higher exposures and lower exposures and everybody in between. And so um, sometimes I'll have a control group, but sometimes it's not really necessary. And I'm just trying to get a distribution um, of the population. So the way that you select your population matters. Um, I didn't really talk about it, I meant to, but, um, you know, I'm, I've started to work with a birth cohort here in Michigan where they've done weighted um, sampling. So they've tried to get a representative sample of all the mother-child pairs in Michigan by, you know, recruiting a certain number from certain clinics in certain parts of the state. And I was just looking at that. Um, geographically the other day where all the participants are looking and they're doing a pretty good job. Um, and what they're also trying to do with that is get a really nice representative demographic sample. So what you might have noticed from um, what I presented is that um, these were mostly convenient samples, communities that have certain questions and interests. Um, and, uh, you know, for a lot of environmental health sampling, it's, you know, can be difficult to get participants. Um, we don't often have a lot of funding. And so, you know, a lot more resources and a lot more thought can go into doing a much better job of making sure that the populations that we're recruiting are really, um, you know, representative if that's the, if that's the intention. It's not always, it sort of, it just really depends on your study question. Um, I'm trying to think of an example where I think I had a control, not like a, Sometimes I'll use like a general population measurement that's published in the literature as my control <laughs> to compare, um, you know, like with the gymnasts or with the spray foam workers, that's what we did to compare and see if their, their exposures were elevated. Um, just again, because of lack of funding and difficulty in recruiting people. 
Um, it's much easier to get samples from people who are interested in the question than people who would just be um, volunteering their samples. Sure. sure. Um, and that actually kind of fits nicely into the next question that has come in. Um, if you have studies showing differences in exposure based on race, race and ethnicity or other socioeconomic factors, and do you take that into account? Do I take it into account for what? Um, in terms of, I guess, in terms of, I'm trying to read this question here, in terms of um, when you're looking at your studies and future studies, do you account for, I mean, this gets back to your point about trying to make sure that you've got a diverse population, do you account for um, the exposures, different differences in the exposures due to race and, race and ethnicity or socioeconomic status? in terms of, you know, exposures in different uh, neighborhoods. Um, and does yeah. that play into when you're putting together um, one of your studies? So, I don't know, I, I guess for a lot of those studies that I was, was showing, um, like I said, they were convenient samples or um, there are communities where, um, well, so for example, the study that we're doing um, in Hyannis, we are making a real effort to uh, recruit, um, I think there's a large Brazilian population, so translating materials, um, Silent Springs been taking the lead on this, but they've been translating materials into Spanish and I think Portuguese. Um, and you know, really trying to make sure that that those that part of the population is not excluded, uh, because they are, you know, a, a sizable portion of the population in Hyannis. Um, so that's an example where, you know, we're really trying to make sure to capture those people. Um, does that answer the question? I'm not sure I fully understood it. Okay. Um, yeah, let's see if I, uh, hopefully the, the person who submitted it may, maybe if, if it's still not quite um, articulated, they'll, um, they'll put in a follow-up question. I do have another one for you though in the meantime. How does bioaccumulation of low and high molecular weight PFAS chemicals differ between fish and vegetables grown in sludge amended soils? Okay. Did you say fish in sludge amended soils? Um, differ between fish and vegetables grown in sludge amended soil. Oh, fish versus vegetables in, okay. Um, I don't think we know that yet, or at least I don't know that yet. That's one of the things that we're, we're thinking about. So I can tell you what I know about PFAS and fish, and I can tell you what I know about PFAS and, and uh, uptake into plants. So, um, PFAS in fish, well, we know that they do accumulate in fish. Um, we measure quite high levels, both in you know, the communities where we have uh, high levels of PFAS in surface water, um, as well as even in the Great Lakes. I think my study, my, one of my students found a study where they measured higher levels of PFAS in Great Lakes, Great Lakes fish versus fish you'd find at the supermarket, um, which was worrisome to me now living in Michigan. Um, the fish, interestingly, don't accumulate PFAS in the same way that we see, you know, by species and trophic level that we see for other persistent organic pollutants that bind more to um, sediments. So that probably has to do with the way the PFASs are moving in the water, water column and the way that they accumulate the surface water interface, uh, whereas other POPs tend to accumulate in sediments more and not, um, not have that same behavior in the water. Um, And then for, you know, for plants, plant uptake, um, like I mentioned, PFOA and PFOS, so the legacy PFASs don't seem to be taken up as much as some of the new ones. So I think there's a group out in North Carolina um, that's doing some work on this and recently had some results showing, um, you know, higher uptake into lettuce of some of these replacements. And I think Chris Higgins' group has also shown that. 
um, that some of the replacements can be mobilized into um, particularly lettuce, but maybe also other other plants um, more readily than the longer chain like a CP fast. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take one more moment here and see if we have any additional questions coming in. Well, Dr. Kerrigan, I want to thank you for today on behalf of Cheryl Osimo, NBCC's Executive Director and our Board of Directors. I want to thank you for this very informative discussion. Um, appreciate you taking the time to share um, your insights with us. And I want to thank all of our listeners today for joining us once again. Um, for those who are interested in the recording of this webinar, it will be made available later today on the NBCC website at nbcc.org. Um, and I want to wish you all a very good afternoon. Dr. Kerrigan, thank you again. Thank you.